So hi everyone. Uh, today uh, we have a conversation with authors, and today we have Christopher Bullman, the author behind the Black Tongue Thief. Hi, Christopher. And, Hello, Patrick. Yeah, and before we get things started, I just want to say thank you so much to Golangs for making this uh, interview happens. And the Black Tongue Thief is out now. And if you want a signed copy, you can check out the Broken Binding because they have a lot of signed books, and one of them is the Black Tongue Thief. So, Christopher, uh, just to get things started, can you tell us a bit about yourself and your book, The Black Tongue Thief? Yeah, um, well, uh, I'm uh, from the United States. I was born in Florida, and uh, I have recently moved to the state of Ohio. Um, uh -huh. In addition to being a, a, a fantasy author, I'm also a horror author, and I've got five books out with uh, Penguin Random House. Uh -huh. And... Um, I've also written plays and uh, uh, poetry. Mm -hmm. I, I won the 2007 Bridport Prize for uh, poetry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and you know, and I tour Renaissance festivals in the United States uh, as a comedian doing an act called Christoph the Insulter where people pay me to roast uh, their friends. No, so, really? <laughs> yeah, really. It's, uh, it's 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 what it's it's what we call a blue act you know it's very dirty um oh. but it's done in it's it's done in taverns you know, <laughs> I know that. Uh, at, at fairs so um this is this is where we get a little bit of my protagonist's uh colorful language uh, yeah. um and uh yeah so the book the book is called uh the black tongue thief and uh it is, I'm so sorry about the lighting here. I'm, I know I it's doing things. Okay, that's better. Um, it, is, uh, it is an adventure, a fantasy adventure. Mm -hmm. It is uh, kind of a dystopian fantasy world. Uh, you know, you, it's, it's medieval technology level, but um, there have been some drastic uh, societal changes. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, well, there have been these a series of three really devastating wars with a competing species, yeah. um, goblins. And I didn't want these to be the goblins we usually see in fantasy where they just kind of hang out in their minds or whatever. And, you know, they're, they're fairly contained and you only encounter them if you go to these dark, creepy places. Yeah. No, yeah. these, yeah, these, these are, these are a brutally competing species who want to dominate and they see us as a food source. Yeah, they're scary. So, um, <laughs> yeah, they're a little scary. I wanted to make them very naturalistic. You know? uh, yeah. Like they have they their 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 physical forms. I wanted to be very specific with how they function and what they are. Yeah. Um uh, oh, but I'm I'm get I can get into goblins in more detail later, but let's uh, to finish about the book. So yeah. here's the, here's this world and we see it and I knew I knew I was building a bleak world. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to give the reader a voice that would make it more pleasant, uh, more entertaining and engaging. So I thought, why not have it be first person and let the narrator be just this wise ass who's full of gallows humor and doesn't take anything seriously. I mean, the world is so bad. He takes yeah. nothing seriously, not himself, nothing. Um, and he ends up, He's, he's indebted to the Thieves Guild in this world, which is called the Taker's Guild, and they've got their tentacles in everything. And he, and their racket is they'll come to you, especially when the army's coming through, getting ready to draft people to go to the Goblin Wars. They'll come through first and say, you don't want to do that. Come with <laughs> us. We'll, we'll teach you to be rich. So, um, but what they do then, whether you've got talent or not, they take you. And they yeah. teach you and they only take their talented students and put them in what's called a true school. And the other ones have to go to a, what's called a straw farm. Uh, and they think they're being trained to be thieves, but really they're just racking up debt. Um, so they have armies of people that they can call on for what's called deed indentures. Mm. Again, I'm getting specific and not talking about, you yeah. know what, I'm just going to talk. That's <laughs> So Kinch, our narrator, is is one of the more talented ones. He, at least he thinks he is. He he believes he went to a true school, um, because he has got some he has got some game as a thief. Um, he'll tell you himself he's a decent archer and uh, <laughs> he can pick locks and set yeah. traps and find traps and all this stuff. But uh, we meet him on page one, uh, waiting in ambush 
as a highwayman with a group of other brigands. And uh, they're going to try to rob this woman they see getting closer and closer uh, for her shield. It's a very valuable shield made of something called Springwood. Uh, it, anyway, it was, it was a bad decision. She's really yeah. not the person you want to try to rob. Um, and he ends up being sent by his guild to follow her on her quest to go to a distant northern city, which uh, has a new problem. Um, it has been taken over by giants, and it's yeah. all the way, all the way across the kingdoms of men. So they've got a long, long journey to get there. Yeah, it is. It is an amazing book, though, because uh, as you said, uh, the world of the Black Tongue Thief is uh, can be pretty dark. Actually, can be pretty dark. But the voice that you gave to Kinch is very entertaining he is very entertaining to me I, to me at least he's very entertaining and i was wondering so this was always your intention right to make the main character humorous right well um the the genesis of the book and the way the way i the way i often write my books is um i'll i'll, I'll have an, a writing exercise for myself like i'll say okay here's this story i want to tell let's mm. just take some characters and write a scene and see what happens Ah. And that's how I came up with the highwayman waiting for somebody coming down the road thing because that's that there's there's tension, uh, there's conflict, you know. But the first time I told it, I told it in first, I told it in third person. Oh, um, really? <laughs> I did. Yeah, the first the first version of that of that first chapter was a third person thing, and I looked at it and I went, and I already had ideas about the goblins and this and that, and I, I realized mm. that I was about to write a grim dark grim yeah. dark book and there's nothing wrong with that i i like yeah. those mm. but um i thought how can i how can i present this without it just feeling like a funeral <laughs> uh, so kinch was born ah i see that's really cool <laughs> yeah, and, yes. and especially your book came out at the right moment because well the world has been pretty bleak uh, lately <laughs> and i think uh, some entertaining book can be a refresher but uh well, would, yeah yeah but uh this one thing that uh, a bit uh, confusing to me is that you previously write horror books right all of them were horror right so this yes. so this is your first time writing epic fantasy it is ah what what why the sudden change well, horror is uh, horror is you know one of my very favorite genres. Obviously, I really enjoy reading it, but I don't enjoy reading it all the time. I like to read uh, other things, and, uh, uh, and the same is true for for writing. Do you know? Uh, like, there's something about a horror novel that needs to have an element of surprise. It has to. Oh uh, yeah. Be, uh, yeah. Yeah. And and after five of them in a row, I went. You know, I could use some time somewhere else and uh, <laughs> yeah. I could I could I mean I could see myself going back to horror I probably will yeah. certainly with short stories um but it, it was it felt really good it felt really good to have horror be something that I could include in it if I wanted to but which wasn't necessary ah uh, yeah yeah that makes sense that makes sense so which one is more difficult for you to write I'd say horror is harder um oh, oh, this, yeah? this, this this felt, this felt like falling off a boat. This felt really natural and organic to me. Um, wow. once, I, once I found the voice, um, it just, it just came, you know. And you, you know, you have the same. You have to do some of the same things in in any genre. I mean, you have to have strong characters. You have there have they, there has to be an arc for that character, mm -hmm. and you have to sort of stage the action in a way that is compelling. You have good pacing. Um, those, yeah, things don't, those things don't change, yeah. but with horror, you make a certain pact with the reader, uh, with the packaging of the book and with the first chapter, you tell them you're in a horror story uh, and yeah. you have to check in with that vibe, uh, every so often you can't have, uh, just a third of the book have nothing that produces mm. dread. Yeah. Uh, you, have to keep, you have to keep doing it. Yeah. And horror, like humor, is uh, visceral. It's it's binary. It it, mm. it either works or it doesn't. Yeah, yeah, um, that's that's true. Yeah, um, but with fantasy, uh, all all you have to do is be engaging and produce a sense of awe, you yeah. know, or wonder yeah. rather mm. than dread. 
So, yeah, yeah, that's true. And uh, your book has been actually has been finished for quite a while, right? Because I remember <laughs> that Nicholas Eames and so many authors, so many authors keep on telling me, you have to watch out for this book next year. You have to watch out for The Black Tongue Thief. So how does it feel now that it's finally out? <laughs> It's it's great. It's <laughs> wonderful. I've I've been waiting for so long. In fact, um, I was so excited that it was coming out that I flung myself to the ground and hurt my leg. <laughs> <laughs> That's awful injury, though. Really, really awful injury. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I'm 52 now. We don't we don't bounce so well once we get a little older. <laughs> If I if I'd have fallen like this at 25, I probably would have jumped right up and head to the head of the bar, you know. You'll be like, but, uh, you wake up and <laughs> let's go again. <laughs> let's go again. Yeah, all 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 people in their teens and twenties uh, have a natural ring of catfall. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry, <clears throat> which authors would you consider as your biggest inspirations, especially now that you're writing in both genre, in horror and in fantasy? Yeah. Yes, um, I really enjoy uh, Patrick Rothfuss's voice. Oh yeah, absolutely. In the name of the wind, he's he's wonderful. And what you know, one thing I love about 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 Rothfuss is that he doesn't he's he, he doesn't write a formulaic book. You know, mm. he's not he's not afraid to digress. Yeah. His character yeah. will stop somewhere, and this is where he is, and it's episodic. And I I see people sometimes, you know criticizing books for being episodic one of one, you know one of my books uh, the, the uh, between two fires that's a medieval uh, horror novel but it's cl the closest thing i had written to fantasy but i wrote it in that sort of medieval episodic way intentionally okay. um but i i'm fond of that because life is episodic you mm -hmm. know you get you get diverted things happen that don't seem to make sense yeah. and there is some of that there is some of that in this book as well there are there are, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to give you any spoilers, but yeah. um, there are things that happen that you're like, what just happened and why? And <laughs> that's life. Yeah. That's life. And it, it happened plenty of times in your book. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, you know, buckle, buckle your seatbelts for it. You're, it's not going to be what you expect. Yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> and uh, so for, how about horror? Well, know? like 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 anybody my age, I was I was I was weaned into all this by uh, Stephen King, uh, uh, yeah. whose work I still <laughs> whose work I still love. Uh, he's a he's one of, he's one of the all time greats. That's just how it is. Yeah. Um, but I also really, as far as uh, some newer horror authors, there are, there are a lot of really good ones working right now. Um, uh, okay. You know. Uh, Stephen Graham Jones. Uh, oh, yeah, he, yeah. He wrote an incredible book called "The Only Good Indians." Mm, yeah, I haven't read that. Yeah. Oh, you got oh, you got to get on it. That's <laughs> that's okay. good. That's good. And do you know it's um, it, it it focuses on in in indigenous Americans. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, but the 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 feeling of the horror and it feels almost like japanese horror almost like the ring or the grudge or one of those it's it's pretty wow. chilling wow, it's pretty really? chilling <laughs> nah, please read it it's good um another contemporary author i, I really enjoy is uh, adam neville and he wrote a book called uh yeah yeah he wrote the ritual you might have seen the film mm. uh, uh directed by david bruckner Who's a, uh, one of my favorite directors too? Uh, and I had the pleasure of I had the pleasure of uh, seeing Mr. Bruckner. Uh, he directed my segment on Creep Show, the re the Shutter reboot of Creep Show. I, I wrote a, a segment called "The Man in the Suitcase," and Mr. Bruckner <laughs> knocked it out of the park. He, he, that that was a very interesting. So if if you if you have a minute, look look that up. I think you'll I think you'll like it. Yeah, I think um, I'll do that after this. <laughs> but Adam Adam Neville is writing some really scary stuff, and his, you know, his he has an area that he t he tends to go back to again and again, and that is cults. Oh, um, okay. He likes okay. he likes dealing with people who've got some weird ideas about what's going <laughs> on in the world, and they get together and do weird stuff to yeah. you. Yeah, <laughs> he's, he's great at that. <laughs> uh, by the way, uh, there is a blind cat in your book. Uh, we, yeah. I know that a lot of people have considered a bully boy as one of their favorite characters, mine included. And this cat is inspired by your cat, right? 
Yes, uh, the cat, the uh, the cat that I have now, her name is Jane, and she's a black cat, and oh. she came to us shortly after we lost Luther, and Luther was the cat that oh. I based Bully Boy on. Um, and oh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's been you know it's sad. It's been a couple of years. Uh, he, but he's the one who converted me to to loving the feline world because I was a a dog person from from way back. I've always had dogs. I love dogs. Still have a dog. And I just I I thought I thought cats were running a con game. On yeah, come people. on, they they can be very mean. <laughs> they can be mean. It's like I don't, I don't you know. Sometimes cats are like, eh, yeah, screw you. I got things to do. <laughs> yeah, clean, exactly. clean my litter box. <laughs> Give me some tuna. <laughs> but um, I do. You, do you have cats? No, I I never have cats. I have dogs. You have, have dogs. dogs, yeah. I love yeah. dogs too. But yeah. cats, I, I yeah. So my my wife, you know, she was my girlfriend at the time. The cat showed up. She. She had had a cat that lived with us, and and that cat and I were neutral toward each other. You know, we we're like, hey, have it gone. Yep, yeah, we we're both here for her. Okay, so you. <laughs> um, but then she, then that, then that cat disappeared because uh, it was an outdoor cat, and things happen to outdoor cats. Oh no. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, he just didn't come home one time, and we don't know what happened. But uh, we like we like to imagine he, you know, he found some money. Adventuring and went to Mexico. <laughs> Good. <laughs> but but it, uh, so the, so uh, about a year after after we lost him, um, this cat showed up on uh, our doorstep where we were we were touring at the time, and we were renting an apartment in the town of Oswego, New York. And this little this little sick blind cat showed up, and uh, we were like. I, I, you know, and it, it had been long enough. I was like, I guess, I guess we got a cat now. Uh, but it turned out he bonded with me. He he really uh, liked me, and, and she was kind. Of, my wife was kind of pissed. She you know, <laughs> she was like, Hey, you got the dog. Why does the now the cat loves you too? Where's my pet? <laughs> <laughs> oh my but, god! But this the cat's name. We named the cat Luther, and he was one of just the 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 gentlest sweetest creatures you'd ever ever meet in your life i don't know if it was you know his his disability or, or what but he oh. he wasn't he wasn't like you know you hear about you know i'd always observed cats to be kind of aloof he was there was nothing aloof about him he wanted oh. to live in my lap and on you know I, I could put him on my back like a like just like a stole and he would just be comfortable hanging out there wow um, really yeah. <laughs> that's <Yeah>. rare <laughs> oh i know and and and, and Jen told me she was like cats aren't usually like this. You're very lucky. That, yeah, you had a great cat. He he seemed like something more than just a cat, honestly. Um, so I I really almost had no choice but to introduce him to other people. So I I sort of reincarnated him into Bully Boy. Nice. And I assume writing him isn't too hard then. No, uh, no. I just have to picture what would Luther likely do. How would what he would move? Luther. How would he behave? <laughs> so, happily, Luther didn't do some of the things that Bully Boy does. Oh, of course. <laughs> 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 And you also, uh, besides writing, you also narr uh, narrate your own book, right? I do. Wow. Yeah. Was it? Is it difficult? <laughs> no, I love it. I love it. I, you know, but I perform. Um, so <coughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a completely different skill set, you know. Yeah, I imagine. Like, like for example, I mean, you know, I, I have, you know, theater training. I have some. I have imp improvisational acting skills, and I, I know how to do different voices and dialects, and I'm good with languages. Uh, but um, I, I sing like a cow being kicked to death. <laughs> so, oh and, the, and, the, and the main character. The main character says uh, at, the, at the beginning, he's like, uh, I'm, "I'm a fair fiddler and uh, I'm a decent singer. I mean, you wouldn't punch me in the throat for singing near you, but you might punch me in the throat for singing near you." So I actually <laughs> used a stunt double on the songs. I got a buddy of mine who has oh. sim a similar speaking voice, and uh, his name's Andrew Sklar. He plays a character called Randall Piper out on the Renaissance Festival circuit, uh. and uh, I got him to come in and sing. And he he you know 
together, he and I, mostly him, but we came up with uh, melodies, he, he, oh. mostly him, for the song. <laughs> so, so if you listen to the audio book, you'll actually hear the songs and they're, they're good. Oh, so. th oh th that is so cool. <laughs> yeah. There's usually no music in audio book. There is usually no music. Right. And, and I came to find out that's because um, it's, it's expensive to get the rights to quote songs or to use or to use music in an audio narration you can't do it so when i would narrate other books of mine my horror novels i narrated two of those uh -huh. um, when there was a song in it i was instructed to just say the words don't sing the words say them um oh, I, did, I didn't know that <laughs> yeah but you know what i had permission from the person who wrote these songs oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> and not only songs. You also have a card game in your book. Uh, it's called Towers. It is amazing. Yes. One of the best section of the book, in my opinion. One of the best section. Do you actually have uh, all the rules for the games? They are. It is nearly complete. Um, yes. Yeah, so the answer is yes, but it is not. It is not quite to the point where I feel comfortable releasing it. Um, um, I, I want to, I want to play, I need to play it more. I need to play like five, like a hundred games, um, <laughs> before I'm, I'm sure, but it's pretty fun. It's really very fun. And it is, it is a betting game. You know, it's, it's like, it, it's like if you took poker and mixed it with Stratego uh, and, um, <laughs> magic the gathering, it's got elements of all that. And when you can, and when you play it, it is, it is like going to war with cards. Oh. And you're competing for this monetary prize, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is so cool. And this reminded me of the King Killer Chronicle because there is a, a game like that and called Tuck, right? In the King Killer that's Chronicle. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I heard I that too. And Patrick Roth was really come up with, wow, with all the rules for that one. <laughs> yeah, I've never played it. I've never yeah, I never it. played it too, but it looks so interesting. <laughs> Hopefully, one day you can release something like that. I intend to. Yeah, I fully I intend to. It's the, the the people I've I've played the game with asked me about it. Um, but you know, that was the pandemic. We, you know, we came to a point where we couldn't gather. Yeah. Um, and we were all in our separate places. And, yeah. you know, I've got my wife to play with. She likes it. But <laughs> uh, I needed to figure out the dynamics for for three, four, and five people as well as two. Nice. Yeah. yeah. And uh by the way, speaking of music earlier, uh I think this applies to many authors uh, like Nicholas Ims. Uh, we got this question in from a viewer and he said, uh, he asked that, uh, do you listen to music when you write? Do you uh, like, do you have a playlist or total silence? Oh, I listen to music. Uh, um, I listen to, I li for this particular work, I listen uh, to a lot of um, Renaissance and medieval music, preferably uh, in other preferably in other languages so that I don't know that that so it won't be so distracting um but uh, I'll tell you one of my favorite uh people to to write to uh there is a fellow who passed away a few years ago but he was a friend of mine and his name was Owen Fife and uh he he had one of the most beautiful voices I have ever heard um oh it's O W A I N P H Y F E and he recorded a fair, a fair amount of music. It's him, and the, he also it, it could also be under the New World Renaissance Band. Uh -huh. um, I would encourage I would encourage listeners to go out and find this stuff. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. um, I just I once described his voice as being his voice sounding like blown glass looks when it's being blown when it's fiery and glowing. Wow. Um, but there was a sweetness to it too. Um, I, I, I highly recommend the experience of listening to Mr. Fife. Uh, also, um, there is a band called uh, Volgemut, uh, W-O-L-G-E-M-U-T, and they've they've got good stuff that I've listened to. Uh, but other than that, I, I, I just listen to a lot of a lot of Renaissance and medieval stuff when I'm writing a fantasy or period uh, piece like that. They never felt distracting to you. Not really. Actually, I, I tend to again as long as I don't have lyrics that are that are. Oh uh, uh, yeah, that's true. That that's true. Yeah, yeah. Interfering because Owen Owen would sing in Hungarian, Italian, 
<laughs> yeah, uh, as well as English. I mean, he was he was an American, uh, but he was he was a gifted linguist. So, yeah, and uh, let's go back a bit to goblins because uh, this was uh, one of the things that interests me the most. Because Nicholas Eames he told me that the goblins in the Black Tongue Thief is absolutely terrifying, and he's right. <laughs> he is right about <laughs> it. <laughs> and do you kind of? Uh, use your horror experience to do this goblin? Well, I think that the, the, the goblins come from the same place in me that the horror elements in my earlier novels come from. It, it's uh, less, like, less like some training I acquired and more like just an expression of things that I find interesting. Uh -huh. um, so, yeah. And I guess having experience with conjuring those emotions, you know, helped me to, to do that more effectively. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's frightening to think of there being another technologically advanced species that uh, predates us. Yeah, you know? so scary. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, uh, but again, yeah, I, I wanted to, I wanted, oh yeah, this is what I was talking about in the, in the, in the first segment. I wanted to ground them it, in 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 a, in a naturalism, I wanted them to be very clear that they were a very separate, not uh, human thing. Yeah. You know, they've got they've got sharp teeth like a river fish might have, <laughs> but they've also but they've also got. I thought, okay, but they've got an articulated tongue, almost yeah. like a like a shell on their tongue, uh, so that they don't bite it off. Um, and because <laughs> of that articulated, armored little tongue they've got they will make a range of sounds that humans can't reproduce. They have insectile sounds that they make when, they're, when they speak. Yeah, so that, it's very, it's extremely hard to speak goblin. Yeah, yeah, that, that is crazy because uh, it was described in the book, uh, the, the voices they make. And I was like, wow, this is brilliant. <laughs> the, he even included the voice. <laughs> I thought <laughs> it was really good. Yeah. And, uh, uh, before we go to the final question, I just want to ask you about the cover art and the map. Do you have any role in designing the cover art? This is absolutely beautiful, by the way. So beautiful. Yeah, yeah no, I had nothing. I, I, I had nothing to do with it, uh, aside from uh, the fact that that I wrote the you know the the scene that is pictured. That's that's Kinch and Galva and Bully Boy approaching the downward tower. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. But uh, no, it was. Um, it was a, a lovely uh, French Canadian artist uh, named Bergeron. I think it's Marie Bergeron, but don't. Yeah, Marie, 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 Marie Bergeron. Marie Bergeron. That's right. Yeah, um, and her her use of colors is is bold, um, striking. I knew that was going to be a you know a grabber um, when I saw it because you can't you can't Very miss striking. it. Very striking. Yeah. One look and I was like, wow, that is gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, and the map, Tim Paul. Did yeah, that. So beautiful. And, uh, so beautiful. Oh my God, Patrick! When I saw that, I you know, because I I made a map, you know, oh, for you that. Did? Yeah, and I I I draw okay, but <laughs> not like not like Tim Paul. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't show. I would have proudly shown you the map while I was developing the book. But if okay. you had if you had first seen Tim Paul's map, I would not show you my map. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tim Paul is excellent. He he makes a lot of gorgeous map, and yours included. Yeah, I I love it. You know, my my wife for Christmas, she went to this company. I can't remember the name of it, uh, but mm -hmm. she went to this. She surprised me. She went to a company that will make a map on like a big on a on a piece of parchment. So Whoa. I've got I've got the map hanging up in my study. If I if I were not uh, if I were not disabled, I would. <laughs> I would take the computer into my office and show you, but uh, don't worry about it. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that is so cool. And I think you wrote an article about it, right? About a map. I think it was on Tor.com. I think. Yep, that is uh, that. That yeah. is correct. Yeah, I I, I, I remember. I re I was reading that one, and I love map in fantasy, so this is a huge plus. And you know, because the, your book is so about uh, adventure and journey, right? From one place to the next. It was really good yeah. to see that. Oh, he was here. They were here. They were here. And they're finally there. <laughs> right. The and you, you can go through and, and you, you can go through and shudder at what happens to them in different places. <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, with that in mind, I was wondering because uh, the back tongue tip is out now and congratulations for that, by the way. Uh, when can we inspect the second book? Maybe estimation? Um, well, uh, I, I, hope to have, I hope to have the first draft of that in by the end of the year. Uh, nice. um, but then there's a, there's a process after that. So yeah. I believe, I believe they're aiming for 2023. 2023. Ah, okay. And besides the black tongue tip is very self-contained right now, actually. I wanted to do that. You know, yeah. I, I didn't, I didn't want to, you know, cause you know, clearly things happen and uh, I didn't, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, I didn't want to leave readers hanging. Should something happen to me. <laughs> <laughs> that is unpredictable. <laughs> that is very unpredictable. <laughs> yes. Oh, I didn't. Uh, we, you weren't recording um, when I told you what happened. So, uh, for your listeners, I'll, I'll, if you don't mind, or you're watching, yeah, yeah, the viewers, of course, of course. tell them. Yeah. yeah. So, I work at I work at Renaissance Festivals, and I do an act called Christoph the Insulter. And uh, my wife is an aerialist, and she's up doing the aerial silks, right? And uh, we're in Texas. And I, I don't know if you've been around the Dallas area in the springtime, but uh, the weather there is, I see, why, I see why people are so religious in that part of the country. <laughs> um, because man, uh, we, we, we got a tornado warning, right? Like they, there, was a, there was a system coming and they, they said, this is, this is a dangerous storm and is capable of producing tornadoes. It is now in neighboring May Pearl. It is coming up on Waxahachie. Hmm. And this was on my phone. I'm in my trailer backstage. And I know my wife's on stage. I'm like, shit, I gotta tell her. So <laughs> I went, I went hustling, man. I went like, I went like uh, awkward white guy race walking <laughs> to try to tell her. And um, Waxahachie, Texas, has some of the slickest mud I have ever encountered in oh. anywhere. I mean, I heard a rumor, and this is like one of those maybe urban legends, but I heard that it actually gets used in in drilling as a lubricant for the drill. Um, wow. <laughs> I, I believe it. Uh, it, it's, it's, it. It's like walking on ice sometimes, you know, and my legs went out from under me just that fast. I, one, one minute I'm, hus I'm hustling toward the stage, meaning to warn my wife. And then the next minute I'm looking up at the sky <laughs> and making, and making pain noises <laughs> while these well, well -meaning, these well meaning silhouettes gather above me, you know. <laughs> It's very awful though. I hope you get well soon, man. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am I am seeing uh, I am seeing a good orthopedic surgeon uh tomorrow. So uh wish me luck. <laughs> You're gonna need it. <laughs> yeah, hopefully hopefully not. Hopefully not. Hopefully nothing too serious though. Hopefully, hopefully. Yeah, uh, it's it's uh, I, I think it's good. I think it's a significant injury, but I think it's one I will I will recover fully from. I feel confident about that. Yeah, that's good to hear, at least. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I think that's pretty much it for today. And I just want to say thank you so much, Christopher, for visiting the channel. And again, once again to everyone, uh, the Black Tongue Thief is out now. And if you want signed copies, you can check out the Broken Binding. They have signed copies of the Black Tongue Thief. Again, thank you so much, Christopher, and best of luck with your book and the release. Thank you, Leo. It was a delight to talk to you, and it was very generous of you to have me on. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah.